more on that later. But anyways, so as an investment manager at Blog Dojo and previously with my previous background working in the investment ecosystem, um, I've always been nested in the early stages, working with early stage founders. And what I find is that they uh, could really use, you know, they need most help to raise capital because I feel like the information asymmetry between founders and the VCs on the early stages is more prominent. Um, and there's a lot of more risk involved in there. So I think one of the first sections on how to raise capital successfully and what I always say to early stage founders is that they need to understand the other side of the table um, and the options that they have generally on the early stage side is raising capital either from angel investors typically at the pre-seed levels or VCs that typically start uh, investing at the seed levels um, and what I've seen is that obviously you guys probably have seen this as well is that VC terms tend to be much more investor friendly rather than founder friendly. Um, I've had some fantastic conversations with Sam Simpson from Founder Catalyst about the different red flags that founders might be seeing in the early stage term sheets. Um, I've seen investments where one of the companies uh, received a, you know, like millions in investment while simultaneously they were asked to pay millions for licensing fees, which effectively meant that they didn't receive any money in layman terms. Um, and then obviously liquidation uh, preferences, like some terms can be really sharky. And what I always advise founders on the early stage side is to surround themselves with the right mentors, advisors, and maybe other fellow founders so that they can get that perspective about what is to be expected on an early on an early stage term sheet, what is not. And I think that's just very important on the early stages because whatever terms they will accept as the first terms, that will obviously inevitably dictate the future terms from other investors as well. Um, and when it comes to angels, the term sheets that they have, they're normally constrained by the rules of SEIS and EIS in the UK, which stipulate that the investors are not allowed some anti or no dilution protections, but VCs have no, no constraints such as this, and especially overseas. Um, I think in my conversations with VCs, what has transpired is that the liquidation preferences and rights, they seem to be more popular in the US rather than the UK. Um, and what something else that I note to founders as well is the internal factors that impact their decision making on whether or not to invest in an early stage startup. So the two most prominent ones that I've seen from my conversations with VCs is one, how much capital is left over in a fund taking into consideration the check sizes versus what amount the VCs want to leave for follow-on investments. Um, one conversation that I had with one of the investment directors from a London-based fund, you know, we met up and, and we were talking about what are you guys investing in? What are you looking for? And he actually said to me, oh, at the moment, we've pretty much used up all of our capital reserves there's only follow-on left so in the next two years we can only make one more investment um and that's something that founders won't be able to find on the vc funds website they won't be able to find you know publicly available that literally just comes from speaking to a member of the vc fund team you know face to face um Another one is the investment deployment timeline as well. So like how long has it been since the VC invested last in a certain company? Sometimes they announce it, whether that will be LinkedIn or Google or other PR announcements. Sometimes they might not announce it. So again, information asymmetry, founders can be left in the dark because if the VC is in advanced conversations with one of the competitors, to a certain startup, then that founder will gonna have a hard time raising from them. Um, so on the other end of the spectrum, from not investing to the points where VCs are most likely to invest, I would say one of those points is when a VC has just announced a new fund, 
that is a clean sheet and technically it would be the highest chance of scoring an investment but also the highest competition most likely um, especially when there's some good PR around the launch of the fund you can expect a lot of founders would be reaching out to them as well um, and with the companies already present in the portfolio um, I think another thing that founders should understand is that VCs might have different allocations of capital reserved for following on. And if there already is a favorite company amongst their portfolio, they might get the lion's share of the VC's capital reserves. And in some cases, that could actually prevent the VC to invest in a new company. Uh, for example, if that company is also asking for like too much, if they are raising like a higher amount, they wouldn't be able to invest because let's say, some capital is left over for other companies. Um, and that is everything, I think, on the VC side. Um, I've been talking nonstop for quite some time. If, if there's any questions, we'd love for you guys to like jump in and ask me. Um, but the second part that I wanted to touch on is the founder side. So how can <laughs> early stage founders build an investor backable business and what I've noticed and what I'm still learning and continuing to learn is that I think especially in terms of venture capital funds not every startup is necessarily VC backable and not every startup needs to be there are some fantastic startups that I've talked with as well that they've reached the revenue generation point pretty quickly and then they've managed to scale without any VC funding and they were very, very proud of that and quite successful in it, which is fantastic. Um, but for those that do embark on the VC um, roadmap, so to say, I think the big inefficiency in this model is that the VCs need to achieve their venture rate of return and usually it could be a small number of companies within their portfolio that actually achieve unicorn level exits. And sometimes, you know, the 20% of the portfolio can actually drive up 80% of that fund returns. Um, and in order to achieve that, uh, VCs need to invest not just in good startups, but in good startups in high growth industries. So ideally, those are the ones that are at the beginning of the exponential growth curve of industry development, because that way, the funds that are typically five years timeline, 10 years timeline, they can maximize their returns over that period of time. And um, what really put it in perspective for me is this research from Harvard Business Review. They did this survey where they analyzed, I think, 101 startups, and they found that it was something like almost 30 that made it to the meeting so one third and then actually only one that landed the investment so what it means is that on the early stage side founders are looking at one percent chance of getting funded and with the current macro conditions of the market this year i would argue that this is even lower than one percent um um as part of my role, I'm speaking to a lot of VCs. And one of the questions that I also like to ask them is how many pitch decks on average do they receive in their inboxes every week? Um, some like seed level VCs that I spoke to, it's even like 500. Uh, from another one I've heard, oh, we get about 200 pitch decks every week. Um, so it's definitely a lot. So the competition is definitely out there. Um, at Blog Dojo as well, we've got hundreds of applications that I'm going through. Uh, there's new ones submitted every day. So certainly there is a lot of um, competition in the space for reserve, like for smaller reserves of funding. And I think for founders um, to maximize their chances of raising, like the simplest advice for me is just to do the research the amount of spray and pray approach to capital raising is huge. Um, and I always say to founders that it's always better to take your time, do the hard work, do the research to learn about the VC funds thesis, uh, learn about the partner themselves as well. If you're planning on cold outreach, needs to be personalized. You need to give 
a valid reason for reaching out and find that link. It takes more time, but it pays off. Um, and I've seen examples across my career journey when founders would just send out a call email without doing really much research. And then that can burn the relationship moving forward. And then when they actually met a VC a couple of years later, that VC was like, oh yeah, yeah. Like you were emailing me back in the day. Um, so yeah, so it's very important to, to always do the research. Um, and then it probably wouldn't be 2023 if I didn't mention AI somewhere alongside the line. So, um, the three verticals that I like to mention that go very much hand in hand with each other is AI, blockchain, and data. Um, and what I find is that founders that can supercharge their startup with that infrastructure are usually set for success. And usually how it works is that blockchain can be the underlying infrastructure. Um, AI tools is something that powers their operations to be faster. And it also sets a good foundation for data analytics. Um, and with higher velocity of data analytics, what the founders can do is that that enables them to have real-time insights um, that leads to better informed decision ma making. Um, and ultimately, the primary objective of data analytics activities is to generate more revenues. Um, and the faster founders can become revenue generating and cash flow positive, not only they are more VC backable, but actually they can also reduce the need for reliance on VC money, which is always good as well. Um, the other thing that I can think of on how founders can set themselves up for success in capital raising is to accelerate their path to product market fit as fast as they can. Um, and what I always say to people that I'm working with here is to make giving feedback as easy and straightforward as they can for their users. Um, so the feedback loops that the startups are creating should be you know, um, easy to find, quick to fill in, they should look nice. That's always a bonus. And ideally, if the startup can incentivize its users for, to submit feedback forms, that's even better. And um, listening to the users, especially the first users, the early adopters, is so crucial because um, with the data on that, startups can discover the trends in user feedback um, and find their product market fit faster. One of the other pieces of advice that I've seen somewhere on LinkedIn, and I think that was from Harry Stebbings from 20VC, um, he said that on the early stages, you should put your closest early adopters into small group chat, WhatsApp or Telegram or whatever you use, um, for them to give you honest feedback and you encourage them to, to tell you what new features um, they would like to see. So that is pivotal when it comes to building on the early stage side. I think as a founder, um, you need to have this unrelenting desire to speak with everyone around you about your business, um, be that potential partners, strategic distributors, potential investors, other founders, um, and also users as well. Um, so there's not really a moment when as a founder, you could say, oh, I'm tired of pitching um, because that's the bread and butter. And I think nailing down the elevator statement um, about their businesses is crucial. Um, it should be simple. It should be effective. It should be exciting. Um, and if it is, then it shouldn't be tiresome to the founder to repeat it every day, day in, day in and out. Um, what we do at Blog Dojo actually is that this is literally what we're trying to do for our startups is that we immerse them in that huge pool of contacts. So there's mentors, advisors, potential investors, uh, potential partners for them. So we want them to go out there and just talk with as many people as they can about their businesses because you know, startups are not built in like a singular vacuum. They are built in an ecosystem. There's this quote that I really like that it takes a village to raise a startup. Um, and it throws me back actually to the topic of my master's thesis that I was working on. I was analyzing the 
entrepreneurial ecosystem of Sydney, where I used to live uh, to finish my MBA. Um, and then also comparing Sydney to, to London, London has a fantastic startup funding ecosystem where everyone is always merging with each other and talking and, you know, like overlapping in, in many, many ways. So for founders to tap into those network effects and, and tap into their network is, is huge. Um, another quote that I know from... One of my first jobs, actually, one of my first bosses, he would always say that your network is your net worth. Um, and I think that rings true as well when it comes to, to, to founders and how they build. Um, so ultimately, all that, um, finding product market fit, how I would conclude it is that it means identifying a good market. So one that is large enough and has enough demand. Um, and then molding their product to actually fit the needs of the market some of the startups that I've been talking with you know you I would be asking them like what's your user feedback and they would say to me oh we don't have any user feedback yet because the demo is not ready so firstly we're going to finish the demo and then ask for user feedback and I was like no 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 you need to be asking for feedback from day one because you could be building the most innovative amazing product with all those cool features and all this amazing ux ui and so what if no one wants to use it um so it's very important to you know like not lock yourself up in that in the stealth mode um personally i ne never really grasped the idea of building in stealth um i think building open just has so much so many more benefits to it um Another thing, aside from product market fit, something that I call uh, founder market fit. So this is something that VCs would be looking for, especially on the early stage side, so pre-seed and seed. Um, this is something what we pay a special attention to as part of our incubator program as well. So if there are founders thinking of applying for incubators, accelerators, uh, those are the industry ecosystem actors that will be concerned with founder market fit even more so um, because on the early stage side there aren't that many traction metrics unit economics to go off at um, so what founder market fit means to me is that you know how well does the founder understand their customer and their pain points like have they been in their shoes do they have experience from the sector that they are operating across have they got relevant technical expertise um have they spent enough time in the sector to build up a relevant network um to learn its dynamics check out competitors products I think one of the biggest red flags I could identify in a pitch deck or in pitching is when a founder says we have no competition. Um, I think there is always competition, no matter what they're doing. If not direct competition, then there will be indirect one. And I think a testament to the founder's like self-awareness would be to be able to recognize who else is in the market. And one of the cool ways that I've seen this and one of one of my favorite pitch decks that I've got somewhere that I've seen is that instead of showing the competition forces on an X and Y uh, axis, as founders usually do in pitch decks, they actually draw up something more like of a mind map where they have shown not just their direct competitors, but also indirect competitors, potential acquirers. So they show their exit strategy as well. Uh, Co-competitors and partners. So they just basically drawn up this industry dynamics map, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, and personally and founders, I like to see a good fit with personality and skills as well. Um, so, you know, you want analytical minds for like fintech, you want someone strategic and organized for supply chain operations, you want someone more creative if they are build, building a music tech product. So that all adds up. Um, and lastly, probably one of the last things that I would say is on the topic of pitch decks. Um, I used to design pitch decks for founders as part of my own solo advisory that I was running a couple of years back. Um, so 
analyzing pitch decks, reviewing them, and then designing them. Um, what I know is that the average investor looks at a pitch deck for about three minutes maximum, if not less. Uh, so capturing attention is pivotal. And I would say the golden rule that I give to founders is to stick to three key points per slide, because with 15 slides in the deck, that will already be 45 points that an investor has to consider. Um, I always advise against uh, asking investors for an NDA to see the pitch deck, especially on the early stage side. I don't think that there are chances where, you know, big VCs would want to sign an NDA to see a pre-seed deck. And I think if there is information that needs to be protected with an NDA, that should come and play later, um, not in the pitch deck. In the pitch deck, founders just should put information that doesn't need to be under an NDA. Um, and then... I remember as part of in my previous job, I would be speaking to VCs, you know, like almost every single day. I, st I still do, but also to founders now. Uh, but I remember at one point I started to ask the same question to all of the same VCs. And when I arrived at 100 of them, I was able to do some data analytics. And what I asked is literally what are you looking for in early stage pitch decks which slide is most important to you and I think it was like over 75 percent of the VCs that said that the team slide is most important to them which makes so much sense on the early stage side considering everything that I said earlier with the founder market fit um, so my pointers for founders here would be to um, make it clear on the team slide of who is full-time on their team and part-time. Personally, I'm not a big fan of when founders are trying to make the team look bigger than it actually is. And it's always one of my first questions on a call with them, who on your team is actually full-time on this? Who's part-time? Who's a contractor? Who's a freelancer? I want to be able to understand that and and VCs would as well. So making it clear in the pitch deck is a bonus, I think. Um, and then always add bios. Uh, I've seen a lot of pitch decks without bios for the founders. And I think that's really um, shooting themselves in the foot uh, in a way. Um, so the pointers that I give for founder bios is to include background uh, experience and main achievement. So BEA. Um, and yeah, I think that would be pretty much it everything that I can you know think about to freestyle pretty much that's been wonderful thank you very much Eva uh, no worries, thank you. There, there's been some um comments in the chat um yes. mainly from Phil McSweeney um, oh, oh, any... amazing good to see you <laughs> yeah he, he's actually had to leave now but uh, is there any questions for Eva this morning questions comments suggestions anything goes From anyone, um, Gareth. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi, Eva. Hi. How are you doing? All right. Thanks. Um, very informative as always. Um, you you mentioned product market fit, and you know we always get lots of questions about what that looks like, how you measure it. Mm -hmm. um, any insights on how VCs are validating that a company has found product market fit? Yeah, I would say retention retention rates and churn so churn of i think churn of less less than two percent i would say already is awesome less than five percent would be something to aim for um and also with one of my um conversations with one of the vcs when we were talking about churn and retention and product market fit she also mentioned revenue quality um, and that's something that I like to think about because how founders set up their monetization will have a huge impact on retention and then also on product market fit. Uh, so whether they charge monthly or annually uh, makes a difference. Uh, whether they have any upsells makes a difference. Um, I've seen examples as well where 
80% of the revenues could come only from about 20% of the consumers, like the super consumers kind of a type. And that is quite risky because if you lose them, that's massive. You're losing like so, so, so much of the revenues. So I think um, setting up the right pricing strategy leads to better retention and lower churn and that translates into product market fit that's how i would say it awesome yeah great stuff thank you thanks thank you very much gareth for your uh, question there um any other questions from the room tom tom no. I, but I'm so sorry I was late joining. I will, I will, I hopefully will, I'll catch the recording and, and the beginning a bit of this, but I, I had a specific question that I wanted to ask you. I'm always very interested in um, the culture of the people that we are speaking to and therefore mm -hmm. how we can positively influence that. So the question I wanted to ask you is for investors, what would you say are their chief biases, cognitive biases, mm. that we should be aware of and be really trying to trigger positively? Okay, interesting. Um, one of the biases that I might, might be able to think of would be a bias against cold email versus a warm introduction. Um, yes, it is harder to reach out by cold email. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. That's why it's so important to do the research and actually, you know, make that cold email less cold. Um, I think a good cold email, it honestly works. If it's good, it honestly works. So that's, I would say that would be one bias, you know, cold email versus warm introduction through the network. Um, another one would be um, the conversion rate on how much you convert from a face-to-face -face meeting rather than a Zoom meeting. And a face-to-face -face meeting still remains higher. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can actually meet with an investor, you know, like face-to-face -face and speak with them and build that relationship, that is still better than, you know, than, than online, even, you know, like after the pandemic and move towards remote global workforce. Yeah. Um, that's the two that I can think of on top of my head, but it's it's a very interesting topic that I would probably dig into deeper myself as well if I may ask a very quick follow-up yeah what do you think is there a is there a way because one of the things um that I one of the biases that I mm -hmm. spend a lot of time probably too much time thinking about is loss aversion mm -hmm. and I think this is a really interesting one for, for investors because they may not have the same attitudes because they are people whose entire uh, culture is about analyzing risk yeah their view on, on on loss aversion may be different to ours. What do you think triggers? Is there anything you can tell us about what you think triggers them, either positively or negatively, when they're thinking about risk and they're thinking about loss? Uh, probably macro trends would have a big impact to that, and I've seen this quoted somewhere that whatever happens in the public markets tends to be reflected in private ones with about like six to 12 months lag. Um, and, you know, currently what I like to say about this year is that we are in a big year of macro headwinds and tech tailwinds. Um, so on the headwind side, you know, you've got high inflation, you've got interest rates that are changing rapidly, um, geopolitical uncertainty as well. That all plays a part because this is what will be, you know, at the forefront of the topics that the VCs are, you know, like talking to each other about. And the VC space and the investor space, what I find is that it's very, very tightly knit. There's WhatsApp group chats, there's groups, there is events, everyone keeps, you know, like mingling together and talking to each other. So they would be like saying like, oh, what do you think of this? What do you think of that sectors? What have you invested in? Do you have any good deals that you could send me? Um, so, so can we put those two points together? Is that what I think? I think this is really interesting. The reason yeah. is in order to make that cold deal email work, if we put the research into thinking what's in their heads right now, yes. and actually try and frame rather than seeing our offer as siloed and a thing on its own, if we can actually say, look, I know you're probably thinking about this right now, and I know you've probably got this, and, and something like me, something like my you know, my, my pitch is, is you mm -hmm. know, is, you're going to be thinking, 
that's the stuff that might make that cold email work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's even like, you know, like what they've invested in, like, you know, like I name, um, I've seen your investment in this company last week. Congratulations. Um, I remember actually, well, my own cold email experience. So when I first moved to London about three years ago, um, you know, like I was kind of fresh out of uni after my first jobs in Sydney and so on. And I was looking for my first job. And I was called emailing partners at some of the VC funds and so on. I called email Sequoia, one of the partners at Sequoia, and I got an email back from the partner at Sequoia. They haven't been expanding their team, sadly, but he really enjoyed my email. And what I've put in there is that I refer to one of their investment in a certain sector, and then I've added some more of my own thoughts on that sector. And I basically said, I think it was about... I think it was actually about sustainable sustainability and batteries. And I just talked about it to say like, you know, oh, it's an exciting sector. And, you know, uh, however, what will happen with more sustainable batteries and bat battery manufacturing is that we might actually run into shortages of co cobalt. And as we move into the electric vehicles as well and so on, they use a lot of cobalt. So this will be something interesting to consider in the next five to 10 years time. How do we manage the resources and so on? And he loved that. So I think it's literally just about like, you know, like allowing them to learn something interesting as well. Like you put that in an email and 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 yeah, and get a reply. Um, I've literally just pulled up something from like my notes as well, because one thing that I found uh, that was quite interesting is stats on where VCs get their deals from. Um, and I think it's data from Harvard Business Review as well. Uh, thirty percent of the deals that the VCs are getting, they come from VCs' former colleagues or work acquaintances. Um, another 30% comes actually from VCs initiating contact with entrepreneurs themselves. Um, and that is actually holds true to some of my friends in other VC funds who told me, oh, most of the stuff that people send me is not good. I just end up scouting myself. Um, then we've got 20% of the deals that the VCs are getting. They are referrals by other investors. 10% um, come from cold email pitches. 8% referrals by existing portfolio companies and the remaining 2% other sources. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. Fascinating insight. Thank you ever so much. No worries. Eva, that data you just shared, yeah. is that something you could um, send us? Is that? Yeah. Can I send files to a chat here or something, actually? Yeah, it's try it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a PDF file. Let me just upload it. Uh, but yeah, the data is from Harvard Business Review, if I remember correctly. Um, it is from last year, however, so it probably would be good to do some more research on that. Um, but yeah, as I'm as I'm talking to investors and VCs, I always ask that out of curiosity. Like, by the way, where do you, most of your deals come from? Um, and yeah, a lot of what they say is, oh, you know, like my friend from this other fund send it to me or, you know, referrals from other players in the ecosystem as well. So, you know, like advisors, experts. Um, yeah, it's 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 definitely an industry where that network is just constantly talking to each other. Whilst we've got Eva on this morning, any more questions for Eva from anyone? I, if they if they come along, but I could probably talk a little bit more about what we do at Block Dojo as well, because we operate on the earliest of stages. So we run an early stage incubator that is perfectly suited for founders at an idea stage or early MVP or even pre MVP. So some of the founders that you know like talk to us and and you know want to apply, they might not even have a business incorporated yet. Or they do, but it's been just about a couple of months, no external funding, uh, they need guidance, they need mentorship, they need resources, and that is what we do. We incubate them over the course of 12 weeks, uh, and we help them to build out the MVP. Uh, we help them become investor ready. So basically everything, you know, that I was talking about, we, we just make sure that those funders are equipped with that knowledge 
so that they can set their entire fundraising strategy right from like the most basic things as like, you know, like issuing a large enough pool of shares to last them through all of the founding rounds to things like, you know, like designing the pitch deck, financial modeling, uh, pitch training, and then obviously connecting with um, with investors. I can see a question in the chat. What's what's the best, um, how's best for getting into the incubator program with us? Um, so naturally we've got an application form, which I just linked in the chat. Um, in the application form, we just want to screen for some of our non-negotiable uh, requirements of the program, such as the fact that we run this program full-time face-to-face in London. So we are based in East London in Stratford and all of the startups as part of the program, they come in every day, they work with us. There is workshops and classes and lectures happening almost every single day. Um, so it always feels like, you know, a big uni classroom when you're there. Um, we bring in mentors, we bring in potential investors. We've got an investor lunch happening next week for, for our current cohort. Um, so as I was saying earlier, we always try to extend that rich and intensive uh, ecosystem of support and people around the startups um, so that not only they can spread the word about what they're building, but get as much of holistic advice and all the different perspectives as they can. Um, and another requirement is that the startups, they can be in any sector, really, but they must be using blockchain technology. Um, and some of the sectors that I think are most ripe for a blockchain upgrade is uh, probably real estate. I've seen a lot of applications coming in from real estate. We should have smart contracts for our house contracts in the UK already. Um, I can't wait when that happens. Uh, then there's also recruitment and HR is another area that is very, very complementary to blockchain. Um, create our economies as well. And uh, there's a couple of music tech uh, businesses that I've seen applying, fintech and DeFi, of course. Uh, when it comes to fintech and DeFi, a lot of those ideas are related to the emerging markets, naturally. So LATAM, Africa, um, and, and other developing nations who have, you know, a much, much, much higher adoption of crypto, and they are somewhat more open to it as well. Um, so DeFi is especially popular in those markets. Nonetheless, because we are a London-based um, blockchain incubator and our network of investors extends across the UK and Europe, we help startups raise from that ecosystem. So we want them to have a robust go-to-market strategy in the UK as well um, so that they can maximize their chances of raising capital here. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much, Eva. That's been very comprehensive and uh, valuable. Um, we are going to give you some um, respect and big ups on uh, LinkedIn later uh, as a community. And you're welcome to join us anytime, um, any of our weekly meetings. Obviously, we've got Gareth's weekly meeting every Wednesday, 8.30, and Matt Moa's recent um Meet, uh, meeting started uh, and that's every Tuesday at uh, six o'clock or at six o'clock in the evening um, but it's, gr it's great having you uh, along and uh, imparting your wisdom with us uh, this morning it's been wonderful thank you thank very you. much yeah. it's good timing because like um, I've literally started going through all of the LinkedIn posts that I posted ever since I started posting there's a lot I think there's about 270 um, and what I want to do is that I want to put them all together into a capital raising course um, that I could actually release. And probably once I do that and I will have like a, a refresh on everything that's there, um, that's probably when I would love to jump on once more again to, you know, to, to chat some more on that. Mm -hmm.